listening to the Construction Big Breakfast, where we give you a hearty serving of insider tips and business strategies to help fuel your day so you can thrive in the construction industry. Now, here's your host, Tip Top Tim Fitch. And welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Construction Big Breakfast. And I'm your host, Tip Top Tim Fitch. And today I'm uh, joined by two guests from outside the event organization and one of my colleagues. So I'll just go around the screen and introduce you. First off, we've got Robin Partington from APT, uh, a firm of London Architects. Martin Brooks from MBA Associates and one of my senior team, Ben Pritchard. So uh, say hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Morning. Yeah, so uh, for reasons to do with um, homeschooling, we're actually recording this uh, late in the afternoon when the online learning or the online lessons have finished and there's, there's less strain on the broadband. Uh, but we're going to pretend that uh, we're just recording this shortly after breakfast, which is what we normally do. And uh, so there's a non-trick question that everyone gets asked, which is Robin, welcome. What did you have for breakfast? And a very good morning to you. Um, my breakfast this morning was actually porridge, but I stupidly added 10 seconds to the timer. And the worst thing you can ever do with porridge is watch it boil over. It's not a good idea. So this morning was a bit of a disaster, but I do like my porridge. And you know that you know the sugar that's the, the I forgot what it's called now, but with the golden, golden, slightly golden colour to it, with a bit of milk, absolutely fantastic. Best way to start the day. There we go. A traditional but popular breakfast. Come on, Martin, what did you have? Well, um, one of my um, one of the things I've done during this lockdown is that um, I've started a keto diet. And uh, that means that this morning I had two eggs, two rashes of bacon and three chipolatas. Um, so I, I feel pretty good uh, having that. I mean, that sounds like a diet quite a few of us could get behind, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a big proper construction breakfast there. And uh, Ben, what was it you had? Yeah, well, I, I mean, lately when uh, we've been doing these podcasts, I've been trying to uh, be a little bit, you, you know, have a special breakfast. But because you only invited me 10 minutes ago, I only had a bowl of cereal this morning. So. <laughs> See, that's what's called uh, yeah, making it up as you go along. Yeah, yeah got caught out there. <laughs> well, I, as Ben knows what I had for breakfast. I think I showed everybody. We have a, we have a team meeting at eight o'clock every morning. And I got into the habit of actually preparing my breakfast at the start of it because we I film it in the kitchen. I had two really expensive eggs fried in the bacon fat left over in the salt in the pan from my, my having made my children's bacon sandwiches with some mushrooms. I had some tin tomatoes with that, and I had them on two tortillas. So it was. Um, wasn't keto, plenty of uh, carb in there, but it, it kept me going till lunchtime. So that that was that was the uh, that's that's the one question that everyone can prepare for. Just on the preamble to this uh, podcast, I was we were talking to Robin and Martin, and of course, Robin, you're fed up with podcasts about Brexit, and I promised Robin that we wouldn't be mentioning Brexit, but we would be mentioning breakfast. So this is a post-breakfast podcast not talking about Brexit. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the reason I've asked Martin and Robin on, there's been, a, uh, you probably, if anyone who's been watching the series of um, episodes that we have delivered over the last few weeks will see there's been a bit of a theme about the post-Covid uh, world and the effect that might have on um, uh, property investment and what the the property investors are thinking about and what their advisors are thinking about is a very good one with Andrew Allen, uh, which we published a few weeks ago. And that's prompted a number of conversations. And really, that's why we're here, because I was talking to Martin about uh, various things and it came up and then he introduced us to Robin. And there's something really interesting to uh, talk about today. So on, as that as a warm up, uh, Robin, what? Just give us a brief view of what your practice has been thinking about 
during the lockdown? Well, it's been, I get, apart from the uh, what everybody's uh, thinking about, I think, which is survival tactics, we've been very fortunate. I think we've been somewhat insulated from the world um, and some of the tribulations that a lot of other people are suffering from. Um, and it's very easy to take things for granted. But I'm, you know, having got through the year, um, and usually I'm in a situation now where I'm it, it really excited about the year to come. I think, you know, it is going to be one of the most fascinating times to live through. Um, you know, people have mentioned it before, but you know, a generation of change happening in days and weeks. Um, a dinosaur like me, an IT dinosaur like me, just adapting to talking to you on a screen like this. I mean, if you'd have asked me, um, you're going to change the whole office, I'll give you two weeks to do it, Robin. I'd have said, no, no it's just not going to happen. I know, you know people are going to have to work from home. You're going to have to learn to talk over a computer screen. I mean, I've done video conferencing before, but not every single day, day in, day out. And as a country, we've just adapted unbelievably. No moans, well, very little moaning and groaning. People have just got on with it. I think that is a real credit to, to, to the UK. It's so for us in terms of business, it's been fascinating. Um, we're, we're fortunate we work across the UK, across many, many sectors, and so we're not as vulnerable to the cyclical nature of one or the other. Um, it's interesting times. Yeah, I, I, I'd certainly echo that. I mean, we'll, I'll speak personally. I was a bit anti uh, video conferencing, uh, and I'm Hope I'm say hopeless. That's, I'm being a bit hard on myself. I'm not a fast adopter or an early adopter. I mean, Ben's agreeing of IT. But when you've got no choice, you pick it up in about ten minutes, don't you? Yeah, but I do, I really do miss the other side though. I miss people. So don't misunderstand me. If you think I'm suggesting that the world is going to go from an office-led world to a home-led, screen-based, absolutely not. You know, we're a pack animal. We need people. You need the banter. You need human contact to test ideas and bounce ideas. But some things you simply can't do over screen. But we'll never go all the way back, though. No, absolutely. It's, it, it, you know, black to white, we're going to end up a shade of grey. It's going to be a balance between the two. It was interesting, actually. Uh, you talk to my staff, first first lockdown, you know, you talk to them, you say, how are you? How are your kids? How are the family? It's really important, by the way, to do that. Uh, and the, the response back is, you know, we're quite enjoying this. I, I could see that in the future I could spend two or three days at home. This is wonderful. Second lockdown, when can we come back to the office? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the weather has played a, a key part in that, though, hasn't it? I mean, we got it's more than that. Adaptive. It's more than that. You you need you need you need a release. You need to run those two lives. You need to be able to escape both from work to home and from work from home to work. I think it's really important. Very much so. Yeah, I think I think we found uh, the first lockdown. We we were um, sort of halfway through two fairly large projects, and it was a matter of how are those projects going to finish. Um, how, how do we how do we um, what can we what can we practically do? Um, you know, to keep the contractor and the client uh, moving in the right direction, and that that was very challenging. That was that was probably um, there was almost. Uh, a will on both sides, client and contractor, to work together, you know. Uh, and I you know I had a saying, I said, look, if we have to start waving the contract and the men in wigs come in, we're not going to win at all. You know, we've got to work together in this. And they did. Um, I mean, there's, there's the usual um, uh, different interpretations at the end, you know, but nothing that's the job's got finished on time. We've got a happy client. And now we've got to settle a final account in the normal manner. So that was the first part of Brexit. The second part has been um, really uh, trying to understand um, the, the sort of how uncertain uh, things have become. And yet there is a certainty out there somewhere. Um, and so it's a matter of gauging. I think in this particular time, it, it, unless you are, have got funds committed or you're, you're, you, know, you have a project that is committed, um, it's very difficult uh, to find the right person uh, to speak to to make things happen. So I think we're going to be March probably, you know, that first sunny day in March when everybody feels a bit better and oh, come on, let's let's get this done. And uh, so I think it's going to be sort of a, a grey February. It's interesting, just on that subject, it's interesting, Martin, 
the uh, the one thing I have found with the, the screen based activity, I was in a, a video conference call yesterday with five local authorities, 48 people on the call. Can you imagine the old analog way of doing that? You'd have needed five meetings. Half the people wouldn't have turned up. It would have been impossible. I mean, there are some significant benefits. And what's more, the, the, the attitude on screen was, let's get on with it. Let's make it happen. You know, it, it was a, it's a very different chemistry. There's some big positives out of this. Yeah, there's sort of a, a you know almost barrier to entry that, that we used to put in place. Uh, I was speaking to someone who works uh, client side the other day, uh, and he was saying he's been having meetings with similar clients all around the world over Zoom and Teams that previously were impossible almost to organise for uh, lessons uh, learned sharing because it would involve you know heading out to different parts of Europe yep. for a week at a time, cost of fortune, difficult to organise. Now it's, uh, you know, how's three o'clock on Tuesday? Uh, um, Absolutely. It, it does seem to have, although it's impersonal in, in many ways, people seem to be almost more welcoming to uh, having those conversations. And it'll be interesting how long that sort of um, uh, carries on. Hopefully, you, you know, some of those walls have come down for good. I want the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely. Jumping off point, really, because we, we're all agreeing that we, everyone's adapted and I think construction and the construction ecosystem has, uh, as I would have expected actually, has adapted very quickly and maintained reasonable you know, output which is at a similar level as before and overcome all of the additional uh, hazards and roadblocks that COVID has thrown in its way. Uh, that's one thing that the, the sector never really gets any credit for. It is amazingly adaptable, which of course leads on to why it may not be the most uh, brilliant in increasing its uh, productivity. Because of that, it's so flexible. However, that's that really leads on to the meat and potatoes, or if you're vegan, the potatoes of this uh, this discussion, which is. We know how we're working now. We know how we used to work. But what do we think is going to happen in the future and particularly how it impacts the way people want their, let's say, their existing assets? How are they going to get reconfigured to the whatever the new normal ends up being? Yeah, what, what, that, that's that's what I thought was uh, or I'm hoping for. We have a really interesting uh, discussion about what do we think it's going to be like and how is that going to impact what we're all going to be doing, whether it's working with a developer, coming up with a scheme and a design, or for the other part of the industry that's going to have to go and yeah. reconfigure all of those offices and shops and whatever it is that the centre of towns turns into. But Tim, I, mean, I guess it's fair to say that those changes were already happening before COVID. We were moving into a world which wasn't necessarily driven by uh, BCO grade A office space uh, and a Landsec brief um, that set the benchmark by which others um, uh, built built an awful lot of office space and the places that we work in. It's moved. It was already moving away to one where the occupiers of buildings were beginning to have a much stronger voice and dictate the working environment that they wanted to be in, and the employers were listening for the very reason that they, the employee retention was an incredibly important financial consideration in their business plan. And so a lot of those changes had already started. And I think the pace is simply just going to accelerate. And we're designing buildings. We were designing buildings pre-COVID and we're now designing them even more aligned with, I guess, ideas along um, uh, uh, the flexibility of office space. And by that, I don't mean throwing silly money at m and &E flexibility and over specifying our buildings. In fact, quite the opposite. Go back to sort of Victorian values and build solid, robust buildings that you can knock seven bells out of, drop staircases where you want, and put plant in where it's needed and not where, it, where you don't need it. And don't spend money on things you don't actually need. Give clients the flexibility to make space what they want it to be. But then also, you know, when you look at um, larger buildings in particular, actually small buildings as well, what happens at the base of those buildings? You know, the planning system was already driving an agenda for giving something back. You know, how you animate street frontage, how you animate the public realm. Well, I think 
Um, the base of our buildings now have got a much more important role to play. So instead of just letting retail happen to the highest bidder per square foot, um, you start to curate your building in its entirety. You, cu you curate the ground floor. You don't just let retail happen. You plan the retail to be what your occupants want it to be so that you provide an environment that they want to be a part of. The roof space, you don't just stick an olive tree in a tub on the roof. You curate the roof space because it's become a social area. It's become a place we talked about, you know, escaping. It's not just a case of escaping from home to work, from the kids and, and having to, to sort of deal with school homeschooling. But it's escaping at work as well. You know, the best ideas, I've forgotten who told me now, but, you know, the best ideas for Nobel, uh, Nobel uh, Prize winners wasn't the laboratory that cost millions to build and, uh, and, uh, uh, and service. Most of the ideas were generated in a local coffee shop or bumping into somebody at a bus stop. Um, and so how do you create those incidental places where you help social engineering to happen and sort of address the biggest problems we've got, which are, I mean, the biggest disease we've got at the moment isn't COVID, it's loneliness. You know, how do you, there are social things, so many things, so many threads which have been running pre-COVID and COVID, I guess, is the catalyst that could help us to address all of them. Yeah, I think that, that there's a, and you know, the, 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 this issue is very wide and um, you've got to look at it from uh, an investor's point of view with the existing buildings. Um, and they, the, the thing they've got to do is make people feel safe. They've got to make people feel uh, safe. Um, they're calling it pandemic safe because the they're saying there may well be another uh, episode, you know, within five years. So it's no good spending money on putting, you know, tape down on the floors and a couple of hand washers hanging from a piece of string as you go in the uh, in the uh, reception area. You've got to look at, as Robin says, the whole use of that building. I mean, are you going to want visitors to go up through the building? Or are you going to bring your meeting rooms down to the ground and first floor? Um, how are people going to how are people going to be traced in that building? So there's a whole system there. As Robin mentioned the M and E uh, and the security. All those uh, don't have to be ripped out and start again. They can be adapted. They can be adapted to make people feel safe. The signage and um, and how you, how you go into that building is going to be very important, and how you're received and. Um, People, and I think as young people and older people, will want to feel safe at work. And that's slightly different from the use of the space. It's how you're going to adapt that core of the building, the structure of that building, the entrance to that building to make people feel safe. So just, just sort of building on that sort of a little bit, I think the, the one thing that will be interesting how um, it impacts central London um, specifically, but when you think about how many people who work in those offices in central London, myself included, Tim included, spend half an hour or longer on a train to get there. So how does that part of the journey impact where an office is? Is that something that will change investment decisions for clients, you know, having to holistically think about how we get people to the building, not just what the building is. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, 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 people, as, as, as Martin was saying, um, you want to feel safe, but you also want to feel that, 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 that um, an organisation is looking after you, not just the place where you work, the, the company that you work within, but the government in terms of the way that you um, uh, have um, uh, sustainable tr uh, public transport systems. Um, I think that's I think that is going to struggle um, to, to make people feel safe, perhaps more so than the work environment. Although having said that, the, you know, the, the analogy, I guess, is a lift in a building. That's the point of compression where people will, are going to feel uh, the most ill at ease. And yet a train is is a, a point of compression on wheels. You know, how do you how do you address those sorts of issues? And the same for a bus. Um, uh, and, 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 and when you get into a taxi, is the taxi clean? Who was in the taxi before you? Um, and as, as Martin said, you know, when you approach a building as a, as a stranger, not the person who's working in the building, how do you deal with strangers? Do, are they allowed? To, how far are they allowed to permeate in the building? Because you don't know their background and you, you don't, you, you're not necessarily able to track and trace them. Do we move away from lifts as a primary means of moving through a building to interconnecting staircases? Um, you know, and, and, and what can you do with a building that makes people feel safe? If you put an ultraviolet battery in an air handling duct, 
it's invisible. The company's looking after you, the building's looking after you, but you don't see it. You don't, you're not aware of it. It still have, has massive benefit, but you don't, you don't, you don't see it. If you change all those, I've spoken to Martin about many times, if you change all the ironmongery to brass, all the taps in the bathrooms to brass, and then you tell everybody, by the way, the Victorians were quite clever. Um, they understood that brass was naturally very good at killing bacteria and bugs. Um, that's something that is very visible and very tangible that a company could do to, and, and, and promote um, internally and externally to say, look, we are thinking about you. We are looking after you. And, you know, the, the other simple things, I mean, talking about transport, uh, more and more people are cycling to work and are going to be cycling to work. Um, now, some of these bikes, uh, not the one that I've got, uh, five uh, £5,000 pound plus. Um, you're not going to chain them to the railings outside. Uh, you're, you're going to need secure storage, proper proper storage internally for it. Uh, and you're also going to need um, proper showers and changing areas because people won't want to go up through the building in their uh, Lycra, as pleasant as that may be. Um, but um, so, again, the, the function of meat and greet and in the building, I believe, is going to change. And strangely, when you look at the huge atriums that people created in their entrances, I think these are now going to be put to use, uh, put to use um, even as coffee shops, but as meeting rooms, maybe uh, safe cycle storage, proper uh, areas to change, wash and change, maybe even laundry facilities, you know, having an iron in the um, there. So I think the, 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 the entrance and the core of the building, as Robin said, the lift is going to be very important. How do we do that? Who actually has to go upstairs is, is going to change, is going to change, and it's going to have to change to a lot of buildings in their existing um, shell and core. Mm. So uh, a move to, uh, you know, like you were saying, Robin, you, you know, co-working, co-living, these sort of more open, shareable spaces, is that sort of what you're talking about? Or it's, more... it's, I mean, I mentioned offices and the way that you need a pressure release mechanism in, in any office space. You know, it used to be the coffee machine, I guess, or in America, it was the it was the water fountain. Um, but now it's become, and I keep calling it the Hoxton effect, which tells you that it was definitely there pre-COVID. But it's it's a social breakout space, an informal, unplanned way of meeting colleagues, having meetings moving away from formal meeting rooms when you don't need them, making more effective use of every square foot that a building has and putting on a social front and, and an acceptable presence. I mean, the days when banks um, uh, were all sort of marble lined uh, or granite um, reception areas, which were, was pretty hostile, actually, and basically saying to customers, don't bother coming in here, you're not welcome. But the same is also true for residential. If you've got, you know, we have apartments now you might change the brief for residential to come, but we've got an awful lot of residential that's already built and it's very difficult to fix any problems to do with storage or an, a, a study area within an apartment. But one of the things that you can do, especially in the larger buildings, is relook at and repurpose space at ground floor. So those, um, those co-working, co-living spaces, the base of those buildings and how you curate the functions that happen at the base of those buildings is as important for residential as it is for offices. You know, if you've got a building that's got lots of small and um, starter one bedroom apartments, what are the people who are living in there going to do when they have to work at home or want to work at home? Best thing you can do is go down to a co-working space. You know, and so you start to cater for the way that we want to live and work without drawing quite such a strong line between the two. I think the two worlds are going to start to meet each other halfway. Mm -hmm. So the, the the problem for individuals then is drawing that line and making sure that your work doesn't take over, that the work-life balance is still there. You, you know, if you are constantly at work uh, for, for various reasons, you know, how do you escape? So we've gone from where we started and are currently wanting to escape home without escaping the family sort of thing. We've got to make sure that we're not constantly trying to escape work because there is no escape. Well, yeah, well then, just lastly, Martin, the, the, um, that's where master planning is so important, but not on a particular project or a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a cluster of buildings, but master planning towns, villages, cities, how we, how, we, how we use and make better use of the glue 
the sticks are, are, are buildings together. The spaces in between, forget the architecture of buildings, it's the spaces in between that matter more than anything else. And as Martin was saying, you know, cycling is going to change, fundamentally change how much space we need between buildings, how we walk and making fe people feel, feel safe. The move away from individual cars um, uh, in, in many of our cities, uh, it's going to change the way that the glue works. Mm. Yeah, I, <coughs> it's that, I mean, the whole subject is absolutely fascinating because um, there is, I think, there's some tension because as, the, as we mentioned, that there are people who thought the first lockdown wasn't too bad. That's when the, it was sunny into the evening and now and then now, of course, it's dark and it's, it's just it's different. And of course, the other issue is the homeschooling, which is uh, I don't know what other people's experiences are, but it's it's stressful and it's not with certain types of children. Uh, I'm speaking, I've got two children, they're both very different. One, it works and the other, it doesn't. So there's that creates stress and problems. However, um, So if, if the children were back at school, um, from my own perspective, and I I love meeting people and doing all, it has been a very efficient way of working, but I'm lucky. You can see I'm in a home office, the door shut. Uh, I can cut myself off from other noise. Um, but I think these co-working spaces, peculiarly, if you're working like this, they're actually quite, there's a problem because of course you're talking Mm. How how do we overcome that? So I think I think there's a, got a headset or something. But that everyone, if everyone was sat close to each other, running a uh, a meeting with people who aren't there, how how does that work when there's just more than one person? You're not in a box, which I am. I think I think there's a a, a more fundamental issue that's that, uh, of mentoring. I mean. You forget, I mean, we found in our practice, we've got, um, you know, uh, we're training uh, some project managers, we're, we're bring, bringing them through. Now, they have really lost nine months of, yeah. of, their, of their experience, of their training. Um, and I, th I think one of the things that people forget is that, um, yes, you can do online learning, you can do, a, but you need the experience. And um, the one thing that homeworking won't give you, well, I don't think it will give you the mentoring of seeing the functionality of, of meetings, the functionality, how different things go together, how people react. You know, and we mustn't forget, we must, you know, we, we're all in business. And one of the things you have to learn is how do people react? How do they react in this meeting? How do they react? And you only know that by being there. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think that the we go back to the office and a part of it, I think a big part of it will be how do we mentor? How do we bring the next generation on? You know, I, I think that's going to be uh, the space uh, and the use of space uh, that will be very important. I com completely agree, Martin. I mean, would, Tim, wouldn't it be interesting? You've just said you're working, you're fortunate you're working from a home office. Wouldn't it be interesting if actually um, you were unfortunate to have to work in a home office because everybody else had the opportunity to go down to the bottom of their building, to go to co-working space where if you wanted peace and quiet, there was a little booth or a piece of furniture that was slightly larger than normal, rather like um, club class or first class on an aeroplane where you were in your own little cocoon, you could have a conversation, you could listen to whatever you wanted to listen to in privacy, right next door to where people were socialising, where there was a lovely coffee machine, where there were also meeting rooms that you could book for larger clusters. In other words, you had a complete menu of, of every possible way of working, literally uh, at your doorstep, unlike one room. Uh, I think that sounds like a perfectly sensible uh, Vision. And that helps to address then Martin's point, which is those chance conversations and people learning by watching, people learning by other people's behaviour uh, and not necessarily being in a meeting, but watching a meeting going on. It's that sort of secondary beneficial learning, which I think is really important. Mm. 
I mean, you could see, for instance, buildings, you know, the, the ground floor of buildings, you could have, you know, the construction building and, and people involved in construction um, can drop in and use that use those facilities you might have the oil building where people in the oil industry or people in the banking industry it, as opposed to sort of a, a we works for everybody um you you have a um you have those facilities for uh, certain industries you know if you're in that industry we've um uh, spoken about you know creating a, a safe environment for the end users of uh, buildings um, but, you know, Robin, especially for you as an architect, you know, you're starting to look at concepts for things being built later in the year, next year, whenever. Are clients talking to you about a different approach to construction as well, about how do we try and have less people on site? Are you finding clients more open and willing to talk about modern methods of construction off site? You, you know, those type of things, yeah. or has that not quite got there yet? No, 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 no. It's it's. The interesting thing is those conversations were already being had. We, I mean, we are we. The construction industry is always trying to reinvent itself, and we're looking for different ways of being more effective and efficient. The downside is that a lot of people tend to look for a magic bullet, and of course there isn't one. So volumetric mod modular is not going to solve the world's problems. It's an incredibly useful tool to have in your box, but you want all the other tools as well. And so um, I, I guess from our client's point of view, uh, a lot of the initiatives that they, they were already targeting to do with BRAM, to do with LEED, to do with um, um, uh, embodied carbon in buildings, things that um, do affect the cost plan adversely quite often, but affect people's well-being and with one thing we have started to understand is that well-being is actually more important than the initial capital cost for many of those who are in in a, in a particular building for the long term owners um, people who are managing a building looking after a building for 20 years rather than those who are just looking to get it built and flip it i think there is a short-termism issue and that will always be with us for those who actually are just not interested they just want to get the building built flog it as soon as they possibly can I think the world will won't be changed by them, but it will be changed by those who have a, a more of a corporate stroke social responsibility about the place that they work and live. Well, one one, one of our clients um, is an American, a large American conglomerate, and uh, we're looking at um, a new a new building uh, for them. And that building, uh, the design of it uh, and the construction, it will actually be audited. Um, by their uh, carbon neutral and it's got to pass a certain test before they get the funding for it so you know it it is it is happening mm. um and you know every part of that uh, construction process um every part of that is being analyzed before they will the the, the you know the, the carbon neutral department has to sign it give it a tick in the box before the funding goes across so that's interesting. It's, it's important for building occupiers, you know, they're really keen to be uh, for their, that many people are proud of the company or they should be proud of the company they're working for. So they should be proud of the building that they're working in. I guess the one bit that will probably change will be issues like occupational density, uh, you know, for very obvious reasons. I suspect the trend from sort of 12 square meters towards five is probably going to reverse and start to become more again. Um, but that can only be um, good if we're not over servicing our buildings. You know, we're not over providing for our buildings. Well, on that note, we've done, I think we've done about 30 minutes. We try and keep these <laughs> we scratch the surface. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> we can always have another episode uh, another time. But that's been, a, I mean, it's been a stimulating and very interesting uh, discussion. And I'm sure we'll uh, re be returning to these themes in future podcasts. Uh, hopefully, uh, you, either or both of you are welcome to come back on in a few months' time. We're really interested to see what happens as we emerge from mm. lockdown and how that affects people's willingness to go back to the office. Um, certainly, one thing we didn't talk about is that this the new way of working or the new normal, which is having meetings exactly like this, there is a there's, there's a there's a sort of a benefit to it, which you can't easily do in a face to face meeting, which is, of course, you can have your phone in your hand and you'll be sending naughty messages to certain participants 
and being quite disruptive. It's, a, it's an enhancement technolog technological advancement from sending uh, uh, messages around the classroom, which I was quite yeah. good, um, many, many, uh, many. I thought you were going to say that you can sit here in short and, uh, and train as a no one will know. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the summer, that's what we were doing. At, uh, <laughs> I mean, life is serious enough as it is. A little bit of humour is, is is certainly most welcome. Yeah, well, yeah, you can do it now without, you know, you know maybe I've just given, a, given something away that no one else knew about. So uh, <laughs> in most of our meetings, we've got our WhatsApp running on the sideline. Yeah, uh, we're doing the same. So that, that just adds a bit of fun and lightens it to help us all get through this. Anyway, Thank you very much, uh, Robin and Martin. That's been a fantastic uh, discussion. There was a few takeaways I've written down. Is COVID the catalyst that sparks the revolution? Uh, and we want obviously pandemic safe property in the future, possibly. And obviously all the whole thing about you've, you've also got to get to the office and how do you make people feel safe doing that? That may not be a construction issue, but it's certainly an issue and so on and so on loads and loads of stuff so i'm um, anyone who wants to get hold of robin or martin we'll put their contact details and their websites and what have you in the show notes um they're both i know on uh linkedin so it's mark robin partington and martin brooks and really just for me to say to everyone thanks for watching uh and of course we'd really like you to subscribe and like and do positive comments um, and all of that stuff to help the channel grow. And we'll see you on the next episode. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. All right. Come to Invent for the highest R&D tax credit you can claim. We help construction businesses get back millions in tax credits every year. Contact us today for a free review. Thanks for joining us this week on the Construction Big Breakfast. Make sure to visit our website, www.invent.com, where you can subscribe to the Construction Big Breakfast on all platforms so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a positive rating. Or if you'd simply share it with a friend, that would help.